Welcome to the third presentation in the 16th year of the Town History Series. It started back in 2005. In fact, most of the, once we started filming, which was 2007, most of the DVDs are available in the history room for checking out if you want. You have, I think you have to, should have a library card to do it, but it's all in and out of the history room. The, um, ask everyone to please turn off their cell phones. <coughs> this year, as in previous years, Raymond James, through the White Mountain Wealth Management in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, is sponsoring, financially sponsoring our programs this year. The co-sponsors of the whole series is, West, is Bath Historical and the Library. Uh, and we hope to keep going for another year plus, plus, plus. <coughs> I have traditionally asked people to, to cough in unison so as to get the noise down, <laughs> but I was reminded last week that this is not the time of year to be coughing. <laughs> right. Uh, with the flu all around and other viruses on the loose, so hold back your coughing as much as you can. And use your elbow. And, yep. Cough into your elbow. Okay, I think we're holding questions to the end. Yeah, yeah, we're going to have time at the end of the presentation for you to ask questions and have a discussion. And Don will be sticking around for a while too, so you could talk with him personally afterwards. But we will get started now with Don Bruce. Take it away, Don. Yeah. Good morning. Um, Happy February 1st. Um, I've been anticipating this day for quite some time, and I know the um, talks here are pretty well attended, and um, I'm glad people show a interest in the history of the area. Um, a little bit about myself is um, I'm a West Bath resident. Um, my parents bought a, one of the old houses in West Bath on the Berries Mill Road. Um, back in 1976. I was pretty young when I moved up here. Um, my grandfather, Don Sr., was, a, was born and raised in Bath, and um, he was in the Coast Guard, moved to Boston in the 1930s. Um, before he moved there, he bought a small piece of land um, in Brigham's Cove in West Bath. Speak up a little more. And he um, <clears throat> built a summer cottage down there. So I can say I know what it's like to be both a summer resident and a year-round resident here. Um, I went to Bath Public Schools, West Bath School, Bath Junior High. Um, I graduated Morse High School in 1984. And um, I went on to college and my degree is in um, parks and recreation and I used to do a presentation at one of the parks I worked at in southern Utah on the place names of Canyon Country. Um, I started working with the um, <clears throat> West Bath Historical Society um, last year around this time just as a way to get involved and um, learn and um, volunteer some of my time and hopefully help preserve some of the history of the area. Um, they had asked me to do this presentation, um, I think it was early summer, um, so I've been anticipating this for quite a while. Um, I think the study of place names, or what an area is called, is a um, good way to interpret the history of the area. A lot of place names are named either after a a person, they can be named after like an event or a story. Um, a lot of place names are for obvious reasons like what it looks like or the natural feature of that place. Um, in Maine and New England it's common to have the place names um, 
their origin from um, what the Native Americans called them, the Indian names. Um, and then a lot of places around New England are named after towns in England. So um, this is a map. It's a regional view of uh, Sagadahawk. Um, easier for people. To yeah, I don't you. like microphones, but maybe this will help. I think Mr. Patterson. Okay, thanks. thanks. Yeah. Um, so this is a regional view of um, Sagadahawk. It's known that the early explorers in the early 1600s um, started traveling to what we now know as Sagadahawk. And in their interactions with the um, Native Americans at that time, they found out that this area was called the Sagadahawk. And if you look at any old early maps or read the journals from those expeditions, they refer to this area as the Sagadahawk territory. Now, Sagadahawk translated from the Abenaki um, language or the word means where a swift river meets the sea. Or it can be ter interpreted as um, the mouth of a river. Um, if you can't see the river, oh, sorry, getting used to this. As you can, if you can see, the river flows through Bath here and goes out to the ocean here. Um, if you look at any old early maps, you'll see that that stretch of the river was um, called the Sagadahawk River, from, at least from Mary Meaton Bay down to where it meets the ocean. Um, of course, now we call it the Kennebec. Kennebec's another um, Abenaki word. It means um, long, or long, quiet water, um, especially it's long and quiet from Augusta south through Bath to where it meets the ocean. Um, I read where there was a um, Abenaki chief who lived on with his tribe on Swan Island in Richmond, Richmond and his name was um, Bashaba Kennebis. Um, another translation um, for the Kennebec, it was identified as as translated from the um, when the explorers met the Native Americans as Kennebecki, which translate to the river translates to the river god. Um, some of the towns have interesting names too, like Arousek, which is right here, which is an island. Um, it's another Indian name um, translated to place of obstruction. <coughs> and um, it kind of obstructs, I guess, the main channel of the Kennebec. And on one side, it go the Sassanever Sassanoa River goes around it. And then on the other side is the main channel of the Kennebec. Um, the, <clears throat> the town of Georgetown, named after um, King George I of England. Um, Phippsburg, named after Sir William Phipps. He actually became royal governor of Massachusetts in 1692. Um, as most of us know, Maine was part of Massachusetts at that time. Um, we have Phippsburg, named after Sir William Phipps, who became, uh, and the town of Woolwich, named after a um, town in England. And then the name of Bath um, for a for a long time, it was known as Long Reach, um, which is a long, straight stretch of river. It made Bath what it is today, a seaport. Um, in 1753, um, the town seat was actually Georgetown. Um, in 1753, what is Bath and West Bath now was set off as the second parish of Georgetown. So if you read any early records, they return they refer to this area as the um, second parish. Um, these days we know it as the city of ships. 
Um, this is a old map. Some of the places I'm going to start talking about now include the um, what? This is where West Bath is on the map now. Here is Bath. We've got the um, New Meadows River right here. Actually, if you look, I don't know if you can see, but on this map from 1858, it labels um, that river as both the Stevens River and the New Meadows River. How many people knew that it was known as the Stevens River at one time? Yeah, and um, there was a man um, named Thomas Stevens who purchased a piece of land at the head of the what is not well at the head of the river in 1675 um, and settled there um, and he purchased this, purchased it from some of the tribal Abenaki tribal leaders one of them being um, Chief Robin Hood um, and here's another um, topographical map um, showing the New Meadows River here. There's a pretty um, short piece of strip of land right here that um, we've got the New Meadows, the strip of land, and then it goes into Mary Meeton Bay and the Kennebec. Um, actually in the late 1700s um, they tried to build um, what a lot of you probably know is um, the Peterson Canal they wanted to create a shorter route from the Kennebec through this canal into the New Meadows River where there were a lot of um, tidal mills set up on the New Meadows at that time. It was, it's called the Peterson Canal. It's actually the oldest canal in Maine. And um, it was named after a Captain John Peterson who was a shipbuilder from Bath. Um, and like I said, they wanted to create a, most of the tide mills at that time, the late 1700s, were in the New Meadows side of the river. So they wanted to connect or link um, all the trees and logs that were being cut on the upriver on the Kennebec and float them down to this canal and float them into the New Meadows where they could mill the logs and um, load them into ships and bring, transport those to destination south. So it was a shorter distance going through the New Meadows than it would have been through the Kennebec. It didn't function too well because of the tides. The um, tides in the New Meadows rise slower, or the tides aren't aligned. The New Meadows side um, would rise before the Kennebec side would rise, so there wouldn't be enough water to make the canal functional. Um, the name New Meadows, um, it's named for good new meadows located along the shorelines of the rivers. Um, one of the early, one of the obstacles that the early col colonists faced when they settled onto the coast throughout New England was um, clearing fields. They, of course, they didn't have chainsaws or gas-powered engines or anything, so it was a it required a lot of labor to clear fields. Um, and in the northern part of West Bath, um, there were a lot of cleared fields at that time, or new meadows. Um, so the name stuck. I heard or read somewhere a, a while back that when they officially incorporated and separated the, or incorporated the town of West Bath, they were considering to name it the New Meadows. But I guess they just decided to go with West Bath. I think it would have, my opinion is it would have been a little more colorful name, but. <laughs> um, this is a early postcard showing the New Meadows River and um, one of the early bridges Transportation was an obstacle back then um, for delivery of supplies and goods. This is one of the early bridges. It's the Bull Rock Bridge. Um, it cost $4,500 to build back in 1841. Um, they call it, 
Bull Rock, there's a little island or a little rock outcropping in the middle of the channel of the New Meadows. And um, as told by an old resident, it got its name when a bull got over to the rock and men couldn't get the animal off for several days. So <laughs> the name stuck. These days, there's a marker in the middle of that um, rock to indicate to boats for navigation. Um, but it's located, the old Bull Rock Road is actually still there. And if you drive down the Bull Rock Road, which is off of Foster's Point in West Bath, drive down a short ways, there's a little boat landing there. And then on the other side of the river is the um, Sawyer Park boat landing. So there used to be a bridge right about there that connected the two. Roads were one of the early um, things to study about. It's kind of interesting how all the old roads were built and um, the importance of getting from Bath to Brunswick or Brunswick to Bath. Um, I'm going to start, I'm going to go from the north part of West Bath down to the south end and kind of work our way from the south side of West Bath back north. Um, and some of the places I'll talk about are the Winnegans, the Indian Carry, Brigham's Cove. Let me show you where these are on the map here. Um, let's see, Winnegans Creek is right here as it flows towards Bath into the Kennebec. It flows um, north in a northerly direction. Um, the Indian carrying place was right here. And this is Winnegans Bay on the New Meadow side as it flows out to the ocean. Um, we've got Brigham's Cove right here. Um, Shoal Cove right about here. And then Birch Point. You can see I'm a little nervous with that point. <laughs> But um, the Winnegans Creek and the Indian Carrion Place, which I said is right here. Um, Winnegans is another um, Abenaki name. Um, it means um, short carry um, or a carrying place. Um, or the portage between two waters. So we've got, um, whoops, the Winnegans Bay as you're coming off of the New Meadows into Win Winnegans Bay into Brigham's Cove. There is um, this narrow strip of land right here, and then it flows into the Winnegans Creek. It was a um, the quickest way for transportation pre colonials was by water. And um, so this is a pretty famous Indian trail. Actually, I learned that um, Winnegans is kind of a generic term for a carrying place. There might have been many carrying places throughout the peninsulas of um, the area, um, but the name Winnegans stuck here. And um, there's an Indian carry road which follows the old Indian trail. Um, one of the first colonists lived on the north side of the Winnegans, uh, Patrick Drummond, back in 1738. Um, they had a lot of con conflicts with the Native Americans, the colonists with the Native Americans back there. Um, I heard that it was Patrick Drummond who was the only permanent settler on the Winnegans side, or the um, west side of the Kennebec River. Um, he did learn to talk um, the language and did a lot of trading with the, the Indians there. And there's still um, some of his stone foundation located um, around um, the Winnegans or Indian Carry Road, that area. Um, of course, um, we know that Indians traveled with birch bark canoes. I did a little research because I was wondering um, how much they weighed and how difficult it might have been to carry your canoe through along that trail. And I, on average, I found out um, a birch bark canoe on average is about 12 feet long and weighs about 50 pounds, so somewhat lightweight to be able to do that carry. 
And then this, um, the other picture shows some of the mills that were built along um, the mouth of um, Winnegans Creek as it flowed into the um, Kennebec River. And I'll get more, I'll get to more on tidal mills later in my presentation, but um, the Winnegans was used um, pretty extensively for tidal mills and grist mills mm -hmm. back in the late 1700s. Um, up from the Winnegans is um, Brigham's Cove. Brigham's Cove got its name from a man named James D. Brigham who lived from um, 1806 till 1900. He was 94 years old when he died. Um, he settled into Brigham's Cove in 1861. Um, he was married to a Nancy Raymond who passed away. Then he remarried to a Marsha Grant who was from Bath. Um, this is his obituary here. Um, and he was known to be an honest and upright man and also a good cook. And he op opened and operated Brigham's Tavern um, where he'd serve lobsters, clams, and fish that he caught right out of the right out of Brigham's Cove and went against Bay. Um, it says he was a very popular shore resident. Um, a lot of the people called him Old Man Brigham, and he was said to be a noted landlord of the main coast. Um, at that time, Winnegans Bay was known for some of the best fishing in the coastal area, and the ride out to Brigham's Cove, either by horse or by water, was said to be one of the most beautiful excursions from Bath. Um, if you'll notice on a, an old topographical map, the east side of Brigham's Cove is um, marked as Perry's Cove, the Phippsburg side. And then if you're coming in from Winnegans Bay into Brigham's Cove and look, um, as you're coming in, you'll notice a little, um, like a hill or a mountain. It's known as Perry's Hill or Perry Mountain. Um, it was a William Alden Perry of Phippsburg. He was another early landowner down there. Moving up from Brigham's Cove, we'll come to one of the largest um, freshwater ponds in West Bath. It's the Campbell's Pond. It's named after a family, uh, John Campbell and his brother, El Nathan Raymond Campbell. They um, settled and lived um, along Campbell's Pond. Um, in the late 1800s, West Bath was divided into four school districts and it was the Campbell's Pond School that was located alongside Campbell's Pond. It changed the name to the Lilly School in 1901. Um, I found an old, kind of an interesting um, newspaper article out of the Bath Independent from 1906 that um, described Campbell Pond, Campbell's Pond. Um, it reads, it is the body of water known as Campbell's Pond Sit, sitting situated close to the highway leading to Birch Point. This pond receives the drainage from the high hills in that locality and is of great depth. Its waters are always cool and clear and in the warm weather a fringe of pond lilies completely surrounds it. Years ago this pond was stocked with black bass and a few have been taken from there every season although it is not fished to any extent. So um, we were never allowed to go swimming in Campbell's Pond growing up around there. Um, I, I heard that people use it for their drinking water and so we were never allowed. Um, one of the wives' tales that has stuck with me for a long time is that I was told when I was really young that um, They'd never been able to find the bottom of Camel's Pond, <laughs> that it was so deep. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> um, we have Birch Point and Shoal Cove. Uh, on the map, here's Brigham's Cove. You come out of the cove. Shoal Cove would be right around here, and then Birch Point's here. Um, some place names are Name for obvious reasons, for like natural feature, features. Um, Shoal Cove 
got its name because it's a shallow body of water at low tide it's um, exposed at low tide um, and then Birch Point um, I'm not quite sure why they named it Birch Point I've been walk walking down there a lot of times and I've never really seen a whole lot of birch trees down there <laughs> but maybe when they did name it there was a the birch trees are a lot more abundant um, we do know that birch was a pretty important research, not a re resource, um, not only to the early colonists, but also to Native <coughs> Americans um, to make birch bark canoes. There was medicinal value to birch trees, um, and you can fashion the birch bark into cups and bowls and use it for writing and drawing and um, things like that. So. Now we'll move up from the south end of town into central West Bath. I'm going to talk about um, Princess Corner, which is, let's see, it's at the intersection of um, the Berries Mill and Campbell's Pond Road, I think. It's right about here. And then um, Sabino is this area right here, and Houghton's Pond right here. Sorry, I'm shaking so much. Um, and then another road off of the Berries Mill Road is the Quaker Point, and then the Berries Mill itself. So I'm going to talk about Princess Corner. Um, a lot of place names, if you look at a map, you won't see them labeled on the map. A lot of things are known locally, and this is one of them. Um, Princess Corner, it's like I said, it's at the intersection. This is the Campbell's Pond Road, and it turns onto the Berries Mill Road. They call this Princess Corner. Has anyone here ever heard of Princess Corner? I think a lot of local people or older people know it as Princess Corner. I've always known it was called Princess Corner, but I never really knew why. But I did a little research um, and found out um, it was named after a Captain George Prince, and he actually operated a tavern at Prince's Corner in 1887. Um, further research, I found out that he was one of the um, first members of a historical society. The Sagada Hawk Historical Society was formed um, in 1877. They actually used to meet right here at the Patent Free Library up in the tower and um, he was one of the first members. Um, I read a few newspaper articles that explain that he gave a presentation at one time about the early explorations of um, the Sagada Hawk territory. Um, and I thought, I assumed since he was Captain George Prince that he was like a ship captain, but I did a little more research and found out that he was actually in 1861, um, the captain of the four, first Maine Cavalry of the Union Army. Um, next we come to Sabino, another popular area in West Bath, a lot of summer homes and year-round homes now too. Um, it's named Sabino after an Abenaki chief, Sabino. Um, some of the early landowners were a Samuel and James Flanders, um, who then later sold the property to uh, resident Charles Bates. And Charles Bates, um, he was pretty well loved and respected at, during his life, especially down in Sabino. A lot of the residents really respected him. He owned a lot of land down there. He actually moved from um, Gardner with his family when he was five years old and settled a lot in the Winnegans area, um, and he attended the Campbell's Pond School. Um, he owned, a, like I said, he owned a, owned a lot of land down in Sabino, and I think he was one of the um, people who sold a lot of his land to lots to build cottages down there. Um, he actually donated the land where the <coughs> Sabino Hall is. Um, it was built in 1922. I think um, in West Bath and a lot of this area, 
Um, summer communities were um, pretty closely knit. They did a lot of things together. And I know the Sabino Hall um, was used um, extensively for suppers and dances. They'd all get together, especially in the summer, just to have a good time and um, socialize. Um, in the Sabino area is another interesting place. It's Houghton's Pond. It's another one of the West Bass large freshwater ponds. Um, it was named Houghton's Pond after a Levi Warren Houghton um, who bought 40 acres in 1880 down in Sabino. He bought the land down there from Charles Bates and his um, he wanted to get into the ice business and when he bought what is now Houghton's Pond. It was just a wetland or a swampy area. So we had to do a lot of work to, um, dredge, to dredge out the pond to fill it with water. He built a dam and went into the ice business, which is a pretty lucrative um, uh, business opportunity back in those days. The ice business, not only at Houghton's Pond, but throughout <coughs> West Bath and um, Maine in general, um, but he did a lot of work, dredged the um, what is now Houghton's Pond. Um, it's pretty shallow at the um, at one end of it, and then he built a dam. It went from three feet on one side to about 15 feet at the other. Harvested the ice. He had a dock built um, on the New Meadows River and down at Sabino, he'd load the ice onto big barges and then they'd ship them to port south, like Portland, Boston, New York, and other places. Um, and then later the Houghton's Pond was bought by a, um, Ralph Merry, who bought it in the early 50s and actually developed a campground around um, Houghton's Pond, which opened in 1968 it was known as the outpost camping area so and a lot of he decorated a lot of the campsites with old ice um, harvesting tools I guess and he used to put on bean hole suppers too um, was one of the um, activities they did at the campground moving on from Sabino up the Berry's Mill one of the side roads is the Quaker Point Road. I couldn't find a whole lot of historical information about Quaker Point other than um, <coughs> there was a, it was named after a group or a fellowship of Quakers that lived down there. Um, back in the mid to late 1700s, a lot of um, people of the Quaker faith moved into Maine and I guess one of their destination was, was West Bath. So that's where Quaker Point got its name. Um, next I'll move up to the Berry's Mill, which um, was named after a Joseph Berry, one of the early, early settlers of not only West Bath, but the whole area. Um, he built a large house and tide mills um, down at the Mill Cove in 1739. Um, he built four tide, tidal sawmills, two tidal grist mills. A grist mill is where you grind corn or other grains into flour. Um, and he also built a garrison house along the Mill Cove, um, which served as Bath's first public tavern or inn way back in the early 1700s. Um, it's, it was written that he was a significant contributor to Bath's development, and the Mill Cove was said to be the hub of all activity in the area. Um, this part of yeah, this part of the town of West Bath was settled before the eastern part was, and I'll show you where it is on the map here. Um, it would be right here. Here's the main channel of the New Meadows. It flows into the Bat Cove area. And then this is the Mill Cove here. The Berry's Mill Road, if you drive down it today, goes right over here and 
crosses the mill cove right here. Um, details about Joseph Ferry's life are a little sketchy. A lot of records have been lost over the years, but we do know that he and his son Nathaniel signed the petition of 1753, which set aside Bath, what is now West Bath, and what Bath and West Bath is the second parish. Um, he was also the captain of the local militia at that time from 1762 to 1771. Um, this is an old picture of the Berry's Mill Road. It kind of follows its um, current day path across the Mill Cove. This is where the Mill Cove Dam was. And then I think these days it goes up more this way, but here it's shown going around that little hill. And then here's a current day photo and an older photo um, showing the old mill dam right here and a, a landing, a boat landing. Tidal mills played a really prominent um, role in the development of this whole area and the Mill Cove dams were the first ones. Um, they'd use the the rising and falling tides to generate the mills to cut lumber. And instead of a circular um, saw motion, they'd be up and down like a, like kind of like a hand saw, but they generate the power from those tidal mills. Um, next we'll move on to the western part of West Bath, um, the Hill Road, which is Right here, it connects the Berry's Mill with the Foster's Point Road. We've got the Mountain Road, which turns off and goes down this way. Foster's Point um, and some of the interesting places along the Foster's Point I'll get to. I'll start off with the Hill Road. Um, it was actually known as the Long Cove Road, named after one of the um, coves a long cove off the New Meadows. Um, the, one of the early, well, the early mailman in West Bath, his name was uh, Edwin Haggett. I guess he renamed what was the Long Cove Road into the Hill Road. And if you read this article, I think you can, but um, he described it as exceptionally hilly and full of curves, hence the name Hill Road. Um, I like at the bottom how it says <laughs> it's not a safe road for one to speed on. <laughs> um, next we come to the mountain road. How many people knew there were mountains in West Bath? <laughs> <laughs> but um, on this old map it shows, this is the, sorry I'm shaking. Um, this shows the hill road here. The mountain road turns off and dead ends down at the end of the um, long, narrow peninsula right here. And if you notice on this old map, um, it's labeled as Rich's Mountain. Um, and I, I was unable to find out who the Riches were. I do know there's an old cemetery in West Bath, Rich's Cemetery, so maybe um, the name Rich's Mountain came from the Rich family, but I'm unsure about that. But it is a um, really long, narrow peninsula. There is some relief. I wouldn't say it's a mountain, but it might be the biggest little mountain in West Bath. <laughs> but um, there are some cliff sides along Rich's Mountain down there. And it's said that there's actually petroglyphs down there, or Indian rock art etchings in the cliff face that um, were done by the Native Americans probably hundreds of years ago. I'm unsure about that. And it is private property down there, so I don't know if it would be um, permissible to go exploring or not. Um, next we come to Foster's Point, and it's another place I was unable to find the origin of Foster's Point. I would assume that it was named after a family 
the Fosters who live down there are maybe a fisherman or something, but I was unable to find any information about that. So if anyone does know, um, I'd, I'd be interested to know where the name Foster's Point. But there are a lot of old houses along the Foster's Point, a lot of interesting places. Um, one of the places I'm gonna describe is um, down at the Hamilton Sanctuary. Um, it's at the site of the old Coombs House, sorry, the old Coombs House, which is down there, um, which was built in 17, 73, originally owned by uh, Philip Higgins. Um, he owned much of the farmland on Foster's Point. Um, he built a salt mill and sawmill in the Bat Cove. Um, it was later sold to a David Coombs in 1834, who was a cattle and milk farmer. Um, there was a Millicent Hamilton who lived there from the 1940s to um, around uh, 1986 is when she passed away. Um, but she um, gave the property to the um, Maine Audubon Society. And it's a really, it's probably my favorite place to go hiking in West Bath. It's like a three mile loop um, that goes through the woods and along the shoreline around Bat Cove. Um, Millicent Hamilton lived on the property for like 40 years. It's a 92 acre preserve. Um, she loved nature. She was an avid, avid birder or bird watcher. Um, and she wrote, uh, and another interesting thing is it, um, it's noted by state agencies as having some of Maine's most valuable shoreline habitat um, for wildlife and birds. Um, Millicent wrote, it is a beautiful, peaceful and beautiful bit of land that has been an important part of my life for many years to roam afoot or to view from the water. It's home to the woodcock, bobo lynx in the spring, to red wings, catbirds and song sparrows, to warblers and flycatchers along the marsh's edge. It is spring and autumn grazing ground for deer. My most fervent desire is that it continues unspoiled for wildlife and that many people in the years to come will find peace and joy. <clears throat> peace and joy there as I have. So, um, next I'm gonna talk about Kings Point, which is a side road off of the um, Foster's Point Road. Um, it's a road that turns off, I don't know where, if all of you know, but the town offices in West Bath, um, it was named after the first governor of Maine, William King, and there used to be one of the early roads down there, um, the King's Highway or King's Turnpike, which is actually a toll road back in the 1800s. Um, the residents used to get charged a fee to take the King's Highway from like Cook's Corner into Bath and um, there was a bridge there. Um, I think one of the most oh. colorful names in West Bath is the Witch Spring, Witch Spring Hill, which is in case anyone, whoops, sorry. If anyone didn't know, this is State Road in West Bath, leaving Bath up the hill and then down the hill and across the New Meadows. The Witch Spring is located um, almost at the top of the top of the hill, right about here. But um, this is a place name um, centered around a story or an event that happened, and um, a loose translation of that story is there was an early um, settler um, from Bath, and he was riding home one dark late evening riding a horse and um, looked into where the spring was and he thought he saw a ghost and he was scared him and he um, took off on his horse running, um, got home, told all his friends about it and the next day 
um, him and his friends went out to look for the ghost or the witch mm -hmm. and um, come to find out it was a just an old white horse in the middle of a field <laughs> so but um, I have a, a interesting article that I found from the Bath Daily Times in 1891 um, it was either written by a Reverend Francis Winter was who was one of the early residents of West Bath or it was written about Reverend Francis Winter um, as he was riding home and it says that this person Rever Reverend Fran Francis Winter he assisted in giving the name to Whit Spring one very dark night as he was going to his home down south of the old meeting house having his rigging very taut at the time he thought he saw a ghost just by the spring at which he was overcome by fear and fell prostrate in the mud <laughs> he told the story to account for the condition of his garments <laughs> Whether true or otherwise, the spring thus acquired its name and will probably retain it until all who are now living shall have long passed away. So, um, this is a picture showing where the old witch spring was. Here's where the Berry's Mill comes out onto the state road. The old witch spring was right about here. Um, there's a road that goes up to the granite table shop, countertop shop up here. Um, but the old witch spring was right about here. There was an old inn um, there, an old long yellow building, um, which operated as a restaurant. Um, one of my neighbors actually got the old sign from the inn and attached it to a shed, and that's it right there. I don't know if any of you remember that old sign, but I, sh I do. And um, the old Witch Spring, the water there was really good. People would come from miles around to, um, to fill their jobs at the old Witch Spring. We, we did. The well water at our house was always really irony and mil minerally. So, and I think a lot of private wells in West Bath are. But um, we used to go fill our jugs here at the Witch Spring. They did some water quality testing there, I'd read, back when it was in operation. And it was um, rated at 98, 99% pure at that time. And it was, I remember it being really good drinking water. Mm -hmm. um, here's an old photo of um, some girls filling their jugs. This is a newspaper article that um, at one time they wanted to build an old fountain at Witch Spring Hill and create somewhat of an attraction there. But um, for some reason back in the late 80s or <coughs> early 90s, I think, they closed the spring down. They closed the spring down because of the water quality um, got polluted or something. So, but I think um, if history teaches us anything, um, teaches us to learn from our past, and uh, I would hope, I hope we don't take our water quality for granted. So, so yeah, thanks for coming, everyone. That's all I'm gonna talk about today. I think there's enough.